Good morning, everyone. We welcome you all to Jan Lee Baptist Church, where our motto is transforming our community by leading people to know and imitate Jesus Christ. We want to welcome our family here and our guests, and we also want to welcome all of you who are joining us online now and in the future. Um, we want to remind everyone that on Wednesday night, our services are still Facebook Live only at 6 o'clock, still working through the book of Proverbs. And August the 2nd, we'll have a church council meeting at 4 o'clock. We want to remind everyone to place your tithes and offerings in the little church at the back of the sanctuary. Remember the missions and the ministries of the church and the expenses of the church still continue. So we want to thank you all for your faithful support of that. Um, our little coin collection box at the back for the month of July, the um, proceeds will go to Project Back to School. And, can, and also a word on that, remember to pray for our school administrators as they navigate through these times and try to figure out the best plan for the children of our community. Um, Grace Ministry needs for the month of July, pork and beans, spam, and oatmeal, either boxes or instant. You can get those here to the church or to Ida or to Grace Ministries. And we have a thank you card. This is from Hospice Plus, and it was written to the lovely ladies class. It said, thank you so much for the memorial for Mary Beth Williams. May God bless your class. So continue to remember the Williams family. Uh, in their time of loss okay yes it's time for another drive-by we've talked about this and God's really put it on our heart and um, we've got a lot of things in our community that we could drive by and pray over our schools our administration building city offices and also the gates to our community um, so anybody that's free tonight at six o'clock let's meet in the church parking lot and we'll just divide up and just go cover our community so and if you're online and want to join us come on and join us six o'clock tonight if you can please stand and join us for a word of prayer our most gracious heavenly father how good it is to be in your house and lord we come before you at this time and we just pray that no matter what's been going on in our life this week i pray lord that our hearts our attention is focused on you Lord, you are a good God and you are faithful in that you cover us and despite everything going on in our world around us, you are true and faithful and you are still on your throne and we worship you. I pray now as we enter into this time that you bless our worship team as they lead us and we pray that our King, our Lord and Savior, that you be glorified. For it's in your Son's name we pray, amen. amen. Psalm 111 says, Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who have pleasure in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and terrible is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who practice it. His praise endures forever. And all the God's people say, Amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory. The King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth With holy thunder And leaves us breathless In awe and wonder The King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing grace this is unfailing love that 
that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you laid down your life, that I would be set free. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me This is amazing grace This is unfailing love you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you laid down your life, that I would be set free, oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done.
always by my side, the one who reigns forever. He is a friend of mine, the God of angel armies is always by my side. another one. Amen. Praise the Lord. Father, we come before you with praise. Father, you are holy and an awesome God. Father, we thank you for waking us up. Give us another day to serve you. I pray, Father, that we'll be in the center of your will, doing your will today. We ask, Lord, <clears throat> that you would just Touch us, speak to us, reveal to us what we need to know at this time in our lives. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, boys and girls. I don't have my glasses with me. For this month, our verse for the month is help me understand your instruction, and I will obey it and follow it with all my heart. Psalms 119, 34. In our Bible story today, girls and boys, we're going to see a woman unconcerned about others' opinions. She worshiped Jesus in the most heartfelt way that she knew. Boys and girls, we can show our love to Jesus by understanding and obeying what he says. He loves us and will forgive us of our sins if we will ask. I love Jesus because he loves me and he has forgiven me. Our story today a Mary anointed Jesus' feet. The story is in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 18. Jesus and his disciples came to Bethany, the village where Jesus' friend Lazarus lived with his sisters. Martha and Mary. Lazarus was the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Lazarus had his and his sisters gave a special dinner for Jesus at their house. Martha served dinner. Lazarus sat at the table with Jesus. Mary took a pound of expensive oil called nard. She poured the oil on Jesus' feet and then wiped his feet with her hair. The whole house was filled with the rich smell of the perfume. Judas, the disciple who would later help Jesus' enemies arrest him, complained about Mary's actions. Why wasn't this oil sold and the money given to the poor? Judas demanded. He did not care about the poor. He only cared about the money because he was a thief. Judas was the keeper of the disciples' money bag and would help himself to disciples' money. Jesus said, leave her alone. She saved this perfume for the day of my burial. Poor people will always be with you. You will not have me with you always. What miracle did Jesus What miracle had Jesus done for Mary's family? He raised Lazarus from the dead. What did Mary's family do when Jesus and the disciples came to Bethany? Gave a special dinner. Next question. How did Mary show her love for Jesus? She poured expensive oil on Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. What did Jesus say, excuse me, what did Judas say should have done, been done with the oil? It should have been sold and the money should have been given to the poor. Boys and girls, this week we're going to make a, a lot of choices. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. The choices we make this week will show 
our love for Jesus or not our love for Jesus. So we have to make our choices wisely this week. This week we can show our love to others by understanding and obey what he says. Amen. Sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. Thank you. That's a good children's lesson for us adults if we'll apply that. Just as we went through this morning, I don't know about y'all, but I needed this today. And as we were singing and and just worshiping the Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. And we are so blessed. And we sang about the victory we have in him. Regardless of what's going on in this world and all that, boy, could drag you down if we let it, we got to remember we're part of the, the victory party. And if we'll just focus on that, then... The circumstances really don't matter a whole lot. They really don't. If we can just uh, maintain our focus on him, uh, we've got so much to look forward to. And we need to be sharing that with a world that's out there that seems hopeless and helpless right now. So we've got an opportunity. We really do. So pray with me now. Father, we thank you and we praise you for who you are. Lord, that you are a God of provision, a God of protection, a God of power and authority a God who is in absolute, total control. And how I praise you for that. Because, Lord, we live in a world that is is full of chaos and disorder and disarray. But, Lord, in it all, there's a plan, your plan, and it will be fulfilled and it will be carried out. And, Lord, we rest in that and trust in that. Father, I do want to mention Bill this morning. Just lift him up to you and ask, Lord, that you do a work in his life physically right now. Lord, that you use the doctors to find out what's wrong and what's going on. And, Lord, that you bless him with your peace and your comfort right now. Lord, I ask that you use us as a church, as your ministers, Father, that we be faithful in reaching out and touching and serving, Father. So we honor you today in Jesus' name. Amen. You ever ask or said, I'd like a (laughs) do-over? There's not a person in this room that hadn't said that. (laughs) Kathy said that. (laughs) No. That's a joke. She's never said that to my face. (laughs) Because if I knew then what I know now, I've always thought about when I was a young, I went in the Army, like say most of you know, it it was a tank platoon leader for, for a couple of years, and I've thought about that. I said, I wish I knew then what I know now. I think I could do such a better job. I just couldn't do it physically. I couldn't do the physical demands that they were asking of me uh, back when I was 23 years old, uh, almost 40 years ago. There's no way I could do that. But at the same time, we look at life and we think, uh, boy, I would like to do that differently. And so we look at life, we look at wisdom, and we're, we're, we're looking again in the book of James, 
And we see here today that, that, again, this is the nature of the sanctified life. We're talking about this, the nature of the sanctified life. That when we came into that relationship with Christ, when we were born again, that part of that, we were justified. Again, remember, use that term, justified, that we were declared not guilty. The penalty of our sin was removed when we came into that relationship. But part of that is that God as being a saved person, has set us apart, has set us aside for his purposes. I think uh, Ephesians uh, uh, 2.10 says that best, that, that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus, uh, uh, that, uh, called to do uh, good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so we look at that. Again, we're going to talk about the, the saved ought, and in that, this book, the saved ought to demonstrate faith by acts of love and ministry. It's a part of who we are. It's a part of who we are that we, as God's people, engage in acts of love and ministry through that. We talked last week, and we've seen as we go through the book of James and look at this, the very beginning of it. Remember, James is the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, but, but in that, he has a change of identity. Uh, we, we know in the Gospels that he thought his brother was crazy. Uh, he was an unbeliever. He, he uh, rejected that, but he has an encounter with the resurrected Christ. And again, he, his identity changed. His book is for those who had, whose identity is found in Christ in the church. That's who we are. We are in Christ and we are the church. Uh, you came to church today, or we call it coming to church today, but you know, really, you brought the church with you when you came today. You brought the church with you when you came today. Uh, I like the idea that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? In the old days, in the Old Testament, people came to the temple, but now we bring the temple with us, right, when we worship. And so again, where our identity is in Christ in the church. We also know in the book of James that the book, the book, with a, has a, the book with a stated goal of, of leading believers to maturity in Christ. That is James's goal. When he wrote this, he said, uh, you need to be mature. You need to grow up. You need to be all that God intended you to be. And so we're going to spend that time looking at the nature of the mature life in Christ, what it means to be a grown-up, a Christian grown-up, and, and how that works. And so we're going to see this. But what we're going to find in this idea of maturity at the very beginning, what we found in verse 2, is that attitude is everything. Attitude is everything. It says here, again, consider it pure joy. I've talked about my dad a lot, and I thought about my dad when I read those words because he was a guy that had that attitude. I've got a video on my phone two months before he died, walking out of a sunroom at the assisted living place, and I've kept it there because he's on his walker going, do 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 I mean, he just had that attitude. I've taken this and, and thought about this a lot, and I think joy is the enthusiastic hope in the eternal person, passion, power, and purpose of God. That is what it is, an enthusiastic joy. We ought to be enthusiastic about being here today. We ought to be glad we're here today. Robert expressed that, it's, that we're here. And you know what? We're fulfilling what the eternal person of God. God's a person. He said he's somebody we can identify with, we can relate to, we can call by name. He's that, that we have the passion of Christ, that, that, that Christ's passion. We know he's a compassionate man, a passionate person, and he transfers that passion to us. Uh, we have the power of the Holy Spirit, and we fulfill the purpose God has given us in the church. And that's what we're going to be talking about in the book of James. We also know in maturity that this, the road to maturity has traveled over the difficult terrain of everyday life. It's traveled over the everyday terrain of, of life. Life is sometimes pretty smooth, and sometimes life is hard. And we go through those. And you know what? Every one of us goes through those smooth times and those difficult times. That's a part of who we are, again, and we find that in those first. And this is what we talked about last week. But in this maturity, what we're going to find is in God's wisdom is essential uh, for godly maturity. We're going to talk about God's wisdom. You, you've got to have God's wisdom. This is what we've been doing for a couple of months, right, on Wednesday night. We've been in the book of Proverbs on Wednesday night, and we've been talking incessantly about God's wisdom. But that's how important it is. The, the wisdom of God. You know what my, my mantra is, right? 
Quit trying to be smarter than God. Anybody ever done that before besides me? How does that turn out? Not well. Quit trying to be smarter than God. God's wisdom is essential for godly maturity. We often fall short of that wisdom required, though. We fall short. I think this is what it says when you find, again, look in your Bibles with me, and we're only going to be in three verses today. I'm going to start with two, and we'll read through uh, verse 8. It says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. But here's the point. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all that he does. Pretty strong words. Father, we come today, and I just lift this time up to you. I pray, Lord, that you speak to us. Father, help me today. Help me uh, communicate, Lord, well. I want to be relevant. I want to communicate your word effectively. But, Father, too, open the ears and the minds and the heart of those who are here today and those who are watching on, on, um, on, on, on Facebook, Lord. We pray this day in the name of Jesus. Amen. So again, we see this idea of maturity, and what we find is there are going to be several things with this when you look at this. Number one, what we're going to find is that wisdom comes from God. Wisdom comes from God. Uh, you know, the Bible never any place uh, says, uh, gives proof of God. No place. When you go into Genesis, it begins with, a, in the beginning, God. It doesn't try to explain him. It doesn't try to justify him. It doesn't try to say where God came. It's just simply in the beginning, God. And from that, everything comes from God. That means everything is going to come from him, including wisdom. Matter of fact, Rick read this morning out of Psalm uh, uh, 119, 11, or I'm sorry, Psalm 111, yeah, 111 to verse 10. Uh, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You've seen this in Proverbs also, but it says, All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. This kind of even went with what Marvin talked about this morning, right? That we come in and there's this idea that wisdom comes from God. He, he's the one that gives it. He's the one who created it. It's, it's, it's all types of wisdom come there. And it says from that, he gives it generously. He gives it generously. And so we see this next phrase of this is that it is available to those who ask. It's available to those who ask. And again, from that, he's not selling it to you. He's what? Giving it to you, and he's willing to do so. He's willing to give you wisdom. But then the last phrase of this is this. Well, let me go here. (laughs) We need to talk about what wisdom is. Sorry, I was off in my head in my slides what was coming up next. But what we find from wisdom is this, is that wisdom is progressive. What do I mean by that? Well, if you go back into into Luke chapter 2, it talks about Jesus, the boy Jesus. He's 12 years old, and he goes, and it says he grew in what? Wisdom and stature. He grew in wisdom and stature. It acknowledges that even the Christ, the the God-man as a 12-year-old boy, was growing in wisdom and stature. I know more today than I did before. Simply by life. Wisdom is progressive. It's something that we start, and you start with a little baby, and how much wisdom do you have as an infant? None. You're totally dependent on somebody else for your life, but as you grow, you want to grow in that wisdom, and so we understand as we go through life, and again, there there are one of my favorite stories out of, of, uh, have you ever seen that movie Band of Brothers? There's one of the heroes in that, one of the true story about one of the men on D-Day, uh, jumped into uh, France, and uh, this guy, I can't remember, remember the actor who played him, but I don't remember the, actor, the, 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 the character's name or the person's name, but uh, they were taking a, a German position. He said he climbed up in a tree to try to get a shot at the Germans. 
He said there were bullets flying, that he didn't die in an interview with the actual man. He said, I, I didn't die that day, was amazing, was a miracle. And he said, you know what? I never climbed up in a tree to do that again. And so we, we find again, we learn, we progress, we move in our wisdom. It's progressive. Something else we learn is wisdom is obtained through education. Now hear me out. I put the education in quotes because sometimes education is formal and sometimes it is informal. Let me give you an example in Moses. Moses it says, or you know, he was educated. The Bible said he was educated in the wisdom of the Egyptians. He had a formal first 40 years of his life. He was educated formally by the Egyptians. It was a purposeful. I think, I think God's plan was that was to, to him to have, to be within that culture, to understand that culture, to understand what was going on. And he had that 40 years of his life. You know, he comes to a place where he commits murder. Uh, the Pharaoh comes after him. He flees into the desert. And what happens the next 40 years of his life? What type of education does he receive? He sees a practical education in being a shepherd in the middle of the desert. And where is he going to take those people when, they, when God releases them? Into the desert. So, so we, we see this idea, yes, formal education, but also informal education and just living life and figuring things out. Finally, at 80 years old, God sends him or comes up to the mountain. He has this encounter with God. And guess what? Seminary starts now. Now he's in seminary. And, and, and his professor is God himself. And you know what? God says, you know what? We're going to teach you along the way. Your education is going to go, and I'm going to teach you about things. And for the next 40 years of his life, what does he do? He leads the people into the promised land, to the edge of the promised land for himself personally. So we, we see it. Again, don't shy away from education, formal, informal, or otherwise. Uh, it's got to be a part of our church. We have to have an educational ministry of the church. This is something we've got to figure out in the pandemic, how we're going to educate one another, how we're going to educate and teach our children and one another uh, in the ways of God. We've got to figure that out when we can start meeting again. I know we got the ladies meeting on Monday night still, uh, but there's other things that got to happen. We've got to progress within that. We also know that wisdom is applied knowledge. Look at the life of Solomon. I'm not going to spend too much time because we're going to talk about Solomon next week because there's some things, I think, that tie with him here. But, but again, what we find in Solomon is he asked God, what, for wisdom. And he's able to apply that practically to the world around him. Now, he does a poor job with his own life, and we'll talk about that next week. But, but again, he had that. God gave him that uh, applied practical wisdom. We call it, what, common sense common sense to be able to apply things uh, to life. We all know that wisdom is to make sense of things, to understand things, to see the significance in things. We, 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 we know that, that in that to be able to look, and we know the disciples were able to do that. We also know that not only is it to make sense of things, but it's to speak well of situations. The, Jesus tells his disciples that I'm going to give you the words of wisdom. A wisdom of speech that you're able to speak. And you know, one of the things I've learned, and I'm still learning, is sometimes that means keeping my mouth shut. Wisdom to speak well in a lot of situations to the world around us, to our situation around us. We also understand wisdom is, is to understand and apply God's word to everyday life. It's that application of Scripture. Yes, we want to come in, and we want to be able to be knowledgeable of Scripture, to understand Scripture, to interpret Scripture as it was meant in the original context, but then take and apply that to our life, to daily living. So we need to understand, again, wisdom is something uh, that we have. But we also know not only is it available to those who ask. Again, let me emphasize here, we ask for it. God gives it as a gift, but then we have to use it to make it practical. It's just like if, if somebody bought you a, a gift, if somebody bought me a new car. I'm not saying I need a new car. <laughs> Joke, <sorry>, at least. <laughs> if somebody bought me, I, to make that practical, it's got to be used. It's got to be used in some way. So again, we do that. But finally, it's something that's received by faith. Wisdom is something, again, you find this at the end of this passage that says... 
Again, when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Now, does that mean that we can't have any doubt at all? Remember the man that came to Jesus and wanted Jesus to heal his child? And Jesus asked him, do you believe? And the guy said, yes, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. It's not that this, I want you to understand this as we go through this. This is not a sense that, that we don't have any trepidation, we don't have any skepticism in anything. Uh, we're going to understand what this means deeper within this. But, but, but again, it, it's this idea that we come with a sense of hope and expectation in God and who he is and what he's going to do. You have to believe, and I sometimes I think this is not so much what we believe about God, sometimes what we believe about ourselves. Well, why would God give me that? You know, it really is a matter of faith. Of coming and saying, if you ask God, God, I need wisdom over this. And this is they're wondering, well, I don't feel any different. No, you believe by faith. I've asked God for wisdom, and he's going to give me in that situation. So I have to learn and, and source that through those other things that we talked about. Developing that wisdom. Moses' wisdom didn't come overnight. Moses', Moses wisdom was a 120-year process that he lived through. And sometimes it's gained by experience, and, and yes, but, but it has to be received by faith. Yes, God desires to give me, is the God of wisdom. He wants to give it to me. I've asked for it, and I believe by faith that God is going to give me that wisdom. And it's going to play out in my life. Let me show you how I think this comes out. You know when I talk about cliché theology, uh, and again, with a deeper po possibility, let me, let, me, let me look at this. You ever heard the saying, no God, no peace? And then K-N-O-W, no God, no peace. That's, a, that's a, what we call a Christian cliche. You find that uh, on memes. Uh, you find it on bumper stickers. You find it on T-shirts. You find it in different areas. But and it, it, it's a cliche. We, we would say those things. There's other cliches we use. But again, sometimes those cliches have different and deeper meanings to them. And one of that, again, no God, no peace. And what we understand from this is this. We talk about the wisdom of God. If there is no God, there's no right or wrong. There is, what, what, is anything wrong? If there is, is a God, we, we might make it up. It might be, society might determine, but really there's no right or wrong. One of the things we also know is there's no ultimate purpose to life. If there is no God, there's no ultimate purpose. And, and we know this, that there, there's no life after death. There's no hope beyond this life. And there's no free will. It's Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, the atheist, the scientist atheist, that says we're simply dancing to our DNA. That's what he believes as an atheist. See, we're dancing to our DNA. We're predetermined. We're pre-hardwired for who we are. And that's what it is. There's no free will. That's if there is no God. But we reject that. Right? We reject that. And in this, what we find is to know God is to know right from wrong. We can go to God's word and determine what, what, again, God says, do this. He says, don't do that. He, 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 again, what, go back to Mormon's children's sermon. It's, it, we can understand it even as children. God says, do this. So we know right from wrong. We also know in the wisdom of God that we know that God has an eternal purpose for us. Matter of fact, I think that's what the eternal purpose is, is to have eternal life. And, and Jesus defined eternal life as what? As knowing God. So it comes all the way back around, right? To, to know God is to have eternal life, and to have eternal life is to know God. And so, so there is eternal purpose for us. We also know that there, we can know life after death. This is not it. This is not the end. And finally, that, that this, that we can know freedom. Jesus says, Paul says, rocks about the liberty that we have in Christ. We are free. We, we have a choice that God has given us. Just like to ask, we, we can ask for wisdom out of freedom. And you know what? We can choose to reject that wisdom. We can choose not to respond in faith. We can be double-minded. And this is where the idea of this double-mindedness comes. This is not one weighing one against the other. The way this literally means in the original text is this, is that I'm literally facing in both directions. This is the double-minded person. This is the unstable person. This is the one that looks at the no God and the no God. And I think all 
James is saying here is pick a side. Pick a side. Either God exists or he doesn't. There's a thing called the law of non-contradiction. Either God is real or God's not. Pick a side. And follow it. Quit trying to keep a foot in both camps. And you know, we do this subtly sometimes because we say, yeah, yeah, I believe in God, but then we act like God doesn't exist, right? I've done that before. Anybody done that before? When, you, when you've done something and you come up and you're like, you know, we've talked about confession, right? Confessing sins. And I, I've emphasized it before. You're, in confessing sins, you're not telling God something he doesn't already know. It's just coming to a pay, place of agreement. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm confessing to you something you already know about that, that I've done, and now we're on the same page. You exist, you're real in that. And so we would come and look at that and, and see that. But let me, let me put some application to this in an illustration. I got permission from my six-year-old granddaughter to use this, by the way. We had this granddaughter with us for the, for the last week. She went home yesterday. And Monday night, she, she came in and she just, she got tired. And she was sleepy and she all of a sudden got homesick. And she started crying and she was, you know, and we, we got her settled down and we got her to bed and and she went and slept all night long. Well, I'm, the, I'm usually the first one up in the mornings, and I got up and got my coffee, and the dog and I went out on the back porch, and we're sitting there having our coffee and devotional time, and all of a sudden I hear the sliding glass door open, and I see Emery uh, up, and she's up there, and she comes crawls in my lap. She comes and crawls in my lap, and she says, I'm better this morning. I'm better this morning. I, I'm not homesick anymore. I said, Good. And we sat there a minute, and she started saying, you know, just talking about life from a six-year-old perspective. And she starts lamenting a loss. She said, you know, Granddad, I didn't get to have my sixth grade, gra- my kindergarten, sixth grade, <laughs> my kindergarten graduation. I didn't get to have kindergarten graduation. Oh, sorry, it's my granddaughter. I didn't get to have that. She's, what's she doing? She's grieving a loss. And then she said, you know what? And I don't know if I'm going to get to go to school and see my friends. And I don't know if I'm going to have to wear a mask or not. And she's have, she has some anxiety about the future. Again, this is from the six-year-old mind. But the reality of it is what? Is that it's what we are all feeling right now. It's what we're all feeling right now. And so in God's wisdom, I sit there and if I use the world's wisdom and to know God is simply, well, Emory, you know what? Life's tough and then you die. So you just better get what you can get now because there's nothing after this. Right? No. (laughs) You know, Emory, yes, we're all uncertain right now. We're all uncertain right now about the future, but you know what? We have a God who is in control of all things, and he knows tomorrow. And he's told us, yes, you know what? That, that we're, and you go back into, into the sixth chapter of Matthew, Jesus said we're all terminal. He said you can't add a single day to your life by worrying about it. And he says that, that from that, that we don't know what tomorrow holds, other than that we're going to have trouble. He said, so seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. We have an answer in the wisdom of God. Let me tell you what, where this applies. The world needs to hear that right now. Your neighbor needs to hear that right now. Because everybody is asking what that six-year-old little girl was asking. What does tomorrow hold? We have that answer. We don't have the details, but we have the answer. We have the hope. We have that eternal purpose that they can, they can enjoy too. God freely gives that. Not only does he give wisdom, he gives life. He gives life. That's the calling for us in the wisdom of God. You know, so we want to complicate life so much. And it really boils down to I 
I know right from wrong in God. I know my eternal purpose. I know that I have life after death, and I know I have freedom in Christ. And, if it, you know, that's the message people need to hear. That's what they need to hear. Let's stand and pray. Father, we come today, and we're going to come with a time of response, Lord, to you. Whether it's a commitment time, maybe, I don't know, Father, I don't know what to, you, you know, you know, and through the Holy Spirit, what's in every heart today, Lord. You know what's going on in every life. You know what people are struggling with. You know what's going on. But, Lord, we want a response to this, to, to come to a place this first day of the week at about noon today in time as you sit in eternity and we come and bow before you and say you are God and we're not. And you have all the answers. And, Lord, I need your wisdom to navigate this world that I can be mature and make a difference with my family, in my life, in the life of my neighbor, in the life of my nation and world. Lord, I need that from you. And so, Lord, we come to submit ourselves and respond to you today. Father, lead. You lead through the Holy Spirit where you're leading people today. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. being here today we had guests today we're glad you're here we're glad you worship with us and if you see them elbow bump with them or whatever we do and i don't know but uh we're glad that you have here if you were online today watching we are glad you're here if you're going to watch later to those who are watching later we pray you're blessed through this uh, again thank you uh, god bless your day and we're going to sing right Shall meet on that beautiful shore in the 
swing, in the swing by, and by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. And all God's people sing. Amen. Amen.